All right. Uh, we are back for more Wet Ink Wednesday. Today, I've got uh, Henry Coates on the on my call here, and uh, we're going to talk about some never going home. Uh, Henry, say hello. Hey, it's a real pleasure to be with you today on uh, Wet Ink Wednesdays. And, uh, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. We have to talk about the, uh, uh, the adventure module I wrote about the First World War and uh, the passions I brought to the project. Of course, of course. But before that, I want to ask you about sort of your general nerd cred. Like, uh, what's what kind of? I mean, you got an Evangelion shirt on, so I know you're yes. in the nerdosphere. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, I am a nerd. Uh, yeah. That much is obvious from looking at me. Uh, you know, I grew up uh, playing. I remember eight years old playing second edition D and D at a local uh, game store right across the street from my church, actually. And uh, we would be there every Saturday. And it would just be, it, it was just an integral part of me growing up playing D&D &D officially, legitly, or making up our own rules with Legos. As I got older, I continued throughout all the editions of D&D, &D, but I, I got into other games that had real big influence on me, in particular Call of Cthulhu. Uh, and uh, uh, I really got into what I would call like hex crawl games, procedurally generated games, depending on where you and your party decided to go. And that had a real influence on how I came up with the adventure uh, that I wrote. Other nerd cred, you know, yeah, I am. A, uh, I guess I will admit that I am a weeb. Uh, I, I, I do like anime uh, and have been watching since a very young age. Uh, my, my, my nerddom has translated into different things. Uh, recently, uh, I've really gotten into boxing and I found out that a lot of boxers are nerds, actually. Uh, we have a D&D &D group uh, that's gonna be starting up at my local boxing gym. But I've been a competitive power lifter for the past 10 years or so uh, and recently got into uh, boxing. Uh, but I like to read books. I like to play video games. And when I got spare time, I like to lift heavy weights. So sure. uh, what can I say? Yeah, I mean, well, I'm going to ask you about that because I do love asking people about the <laughs> sort of when, when the Venn diagrams cross over between like multiple things that they do. Like, I, I think I've heard, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I've heard that like a lot of those martial arts type things like boxing or MMA they're they're like all they're more in your head than you would expect i mean obviously you got to be fit enough to oh, yeah. throw the punch or whatever but like does that do yeah. you feel like that boxing and like what's that overlap for you between boxing and ttrpg like what what do you see as the overlap so, there that's a that's a really good question you know boxing is i think more of a thinking person's game a thinking person's action than generally understood because every action has an equal and opposite reaction and you are playing mind games basically with the person across from you yeah you're trying to hit the person and score points that way and you're trying to hit them in such a way that they're not going to want to hit you back but they're also trying to hit you so you're always trying to do basically this dance one way or another it's basically open acting oh, it, 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 it's basically a very physical and violent form of improv one thing i didn't mention about nerd them though is that i'm really in pro wrestling as well particularly aew and i'm into this again this this visceral act of collective storytelling yes boxing is a sport but it is also a story being told by two people in a ring professional wrestling is a form of entertainment but again it is a physical activity of storytelling between people when you sit around a table playing a tabletop rpg it's a collective effort at storytelling bound by rules one way or another so yeah physical sports you know while sometimes written off as jockey behavior man those those folks that i box with or 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 or, or, or wrestle with whatever they're some of the nerdiest folks you have ever met in your life and it is completely awesome that the way that the two worlds uh interact at times well thanks for sharing that insight uh i i i want to hear an update someday about like what kind of adventure you have with your fellow boxers at the 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 D and D group that spirals sure. out of the boxing gym, like I can imagine that. I mean, you just replace 
like the tavern with the boxing gym and i'm sure that's like a, perfect <laughs> yeah. quest, a quest generator right like who's in the boxing gym this week what kind of old rivalries like the old coach is there like you know whatever so uh, uh yeah. meticulous storytelling can come out of almost any environment if you just have the eyes and ears to discover it right uh <laughs> i I, I think I agree. And uh, I'm going to take that as a little bit of a uh, segue into talking about uh, the Never Going Home project and kind of talking about story and drawing inspirations for a story. And um, first, I want to hear how you I mean, I, I, I first, I want to hear how you got connected to Wet Ink and, and the, the game Never Going Home. Like, uh, just tell us, I, I think well, I know the answer, but tell 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 everyone what your version of it is. So Brandon, one of the creators of uh, um, Never Going Home, is a very old friend of mine. I have known him since I was in college, close to almost 20 years ago. And I knew he had been involved with writing RPGs, tabletop RPGs, for a good long time. He knew, uh, we, we randomly ran into each other at Gen Con this past year. And when I say randomly, I had no idea that he was going to be there. And we just embraced each other. And it was wonderful. It was the first time I'd seen him since 2007. And, wow. you know, we, we, got, we got talking about this project that I had known about. And I think I backed on Kickstarter. I, I backed some Wet Ink projects on Kickstarter prior to this. But the First World War has always been a passion of mine. He knew that. And he asked me if I'd be willing to write something. I had never written for a tabletop RPG before. I'd never officially written for anything game related before, but he saw my passion, recognized my talent and knew my experience, both storytelling and in RPGs. Uh, he recognized something in me and asked me to participate. And it was a great honor uh, to do so. Uh, and uh, as I said earlier, it is a privilege to be able to talk about it today. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about uh, either you can either do one first and then the other, like what's the adventure and then what's the inspiration? Because I know you've already shared with me or you can do sort of the experience that kind of informed what you wrote, like whichever way makes more sense to to tell sure. us. I want to hear about sure, both sure. pieces. So I have been what you could call a nut about the First World War basically since the centennial uh, and right before, so starting around 2013, 2014. Right. And um, I, I have... It's a good time to jump on. A good time to jump yeah, on. Yeah, it was, was a, good, a time, good time to jump on. A lot of media yeah. was coming out at that time. I mean, that's sort of where, I mean... Yeah. I mean, that's we, we were running the campaign in November of 2018. So it was... Yeah. That, that's when we yeah. were funding the project. So it was the 100 years since the end of the war when we were running it. So it was very much in the timeline. It's a fascinating period of history, a horrifying period of history, a transformational period of history, and I just delved deeply into it, not simply on the military side, but on the cultural side, and the way that forces combine to create, to use a cliche in a way, a brave new world. And nobody knew that the Second World War was coming, right? Nobody sure. knew that this was the first world war it was the great war and it captured the imagination of generations yet it is overshadowed by the second world war to such an extent and for good reason for many in many respects but the elements of the first world war that just so captured me weren't simply just you know your traditional tommy's versus you know lions led by donkeys type things it was the collective effort of nation states to fight for causes that they believed in yet at such considerable cost that rightfully horrifies us today you know all war i believe has an element of cosmic horror to it mm. in in real life now what yeah. i try to do with this module is to add in game terms a little bit of cosmic horror to it I'll get to that in one minute, though, because it comes from a very specific place in sure. my own experience. In 2019, uh, uh, my father and I traveled to northern France to uh, uh, take a tour along the old front line, right? And so we went from Ypres uh, all the way down uh, to the Somme. We didn't get down more into southern France like we're done, but we did spend a lot of time around the Somme River. 
and we were with a British tour company, a very good one. And we, you know, we went to museums, but the thing that stuck with you was, was the graveyards. They're, they're everywhere. They're absolutely everywhere. And some are absolutely massive, which with, with the British graveyards, with, with, with tens and thousands of stones, with, with name, rank, age, known unto God, or with a personality, with, with, with an inscription written by the family. You know, the British didn't bring anybody home, anybody never trans went back over the English Channel. They're they're all buried near where they fell. Hmm. The German cemeteries were very different. And after the Second World War, individualized German seminaries were basically turned into four or six mass German graves across Belgium and France. And so you have in pits, basically, and I haven't been inside of them, of course, but they're basically just pits lined up with bones and things like this. Tens and tens of thousands of people, of men, buried. And it, it is such a humbling, stark experience. Now, the British tour basically only took us to British, French, and German sites. And, you know, the French also had these massive, both stone graveyards, which would be double-sided, right? Which they would have a name on each side. Just to give you a sense of the scale, tens of thousands of these things with names on each side, also with mass graves. Completely humbling. But what the British tour didn't do was take us to the American um, uh, graveyards, uh, to the American battlefields. Uh, understandable reasons, we really only went up to 1917, and the Americans didn't get involved in the war until about April 1917, and really didn't get over there until about that summer. And combat operations really didn't get going for them uh, until, you know, about July 1918. Anyway... But we were taken, my, my father and I rented a car and we went to the Hindenburg line and we went to the American cemetery on the Somme and we discovered while there that it is one of the rarest American foreign cemeteries visited. I, I met with the guy uh, appointed by the federal government basically to manage all uh, um, American military graveyards in, in Europe. And he pointed out that that nobody big had come since Obama had visited in, I think, in like 2015 or something like that. And that it rarely gets visitors. And so he was so happy to see me. He gave me a personal tour. And I see all these Medal of Honors. And I see these nurses who were there. And I see folks from uh, New Jersey, where I'm from originally. And I discovered that all these men uh, were from, uh, died cracking the Hindenburg line. They had been what were called, for the most part, borrowed soldiers, right? Mm -hmm. And they had all originally been buried in mass graves and had been pulled out uh, uh, individually and, and laid down where we saw them today. And so my adventure uh, module, however you want to call it, uh, was inspired by cosmic horror, hex crawled, experience, uh, uh, gameplay ideas based out of my experiences at this American cemetery on the Somme. Uh, it was a truly humbling experience. I could talk about it uh, at quite some length. The adventure that I wrote, I don't remember the names and divisions off the top of my head, but they were the ones that were actually buried at this American cemetery on the Somme, mm. right? So I tried to incorporate real history um, with the story that I was trying to tell or that I was empowering the GM to tell uh, right. in the module. That was very important to me. It's not my story. I'm just applying the bones, right? <laughs> I, it's it's The story is up to the GM to tell, but I, I think that there are good bones there that are based in actual history. I could talk more about the actual history if you want, or we could go whatever direction you want to go in but i can i could talk about this for a good long time sure we uh, i i i get that sense that you could uh will i uh we'll we'll try to focus it down just a little bit like uh the um the i i really like this idea you were talking about the german graves and there's that there's still these i mean bo i mean what i'm imagining is like the images that you get of like uh paris with the, with the roman catacombs and stuff there in paris or, or other places where you've got just stacks and stacks and stacks of bones around. 
Um, I, I, do, I don't know if that's what these mass graves look like as you describe them, but that's the image that comes into my head. So that's like a perfect sort of, you've got all those eldritch things and, and the, 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 you know, uh, uh, you know, hallways made of human remains is, is sort of a, um, a perfect place to set something creepy and something, uh, you know, some force uh, that is otherworldly going on. Yeah, but um, rightfully so. But you have to remember that the greatest cause of death in the second world wasn't in the first world war wasn't bullets. It was sure. artillery. Right. Right. So a lot of these bones are just in boxes. Mm -hmm. That's all that remains. Right. And you do have, you know, full size corpses and you do have them in these type of mass graves. But just but the horror of that, that all that remains of you after being exploded is in a box this size. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to capture that feeling, that well, horror. Yeah. Um, it is such an interesting thing, like to have been sort of like, I don't know, anonymized, you, you you mentioned known unto God, but like anonymized in a mass grave, but then individually pulled out. It's almost like a, yeah. a question, like what remains of the collective uh, imprint of death on the individual remains after you pull them out. It's sort of like, a, yeah. it is sort of like, a, and I don't know if that's exactly what you were thinking of when you put together your uh your mission um but that that's kind of what i'm thinking of hearing you talk about it um that's uh yeah that's a, that's a good observation yes yes um uh it, i don't it's think... just a real oh go ahead go ahead no i'm just saying it's just a fascinating experience and you know they're they're still discovering people today they're still identifying people uh today um and it, it's very touching because although the war is over a hundred years ago the real prospect to never forget and to we shall remember them it's still it still resounds uh in particularly anglo and french culture so yeah i think like you said the i mean we there's so much history to talk about but like i think the numbers as you were recounting the the brief history there like you know america tried to remain neutral they did eventually get involved and then like major combat operations for Americans uh, as a military, like individual Americans had been part of the war since the beginning, but like as a, as a military, it was 1918 that really was their the, sort of their banner year, I guess, uh, which is when the book that your adventurer will appear yeah. in is set. Uh, it's set during that 1918 push. Um, and, and so the, you're talking about breaking of the line and stuff like that. That's all part of that narrative, but the, um, the, what I was saying is like the, the the numbers are so small relative for America. The numbers of of veterans of the First World War are so much yeah. smaller than the number of people who went into World War II. So I think it, yeah. that's part of the reason why it got so uh, it is easier to forget it for Americans because the, yeah. the Second World War played so much more on the had so much more yeah. of a cultural imprint um, and it's the opposite i think in some ways for france and britain uh yeah. well i mean there's plenty of world war ii stuff that happened in france and britain but i mean like they've got the graveyards like you were saying they, they yeah, got them yeah. right over there still you can go you can go <laughs> yeah. so it, it makes sense that it's a bigger effort the memorial and i know they do the um the, yeah. you know the, the the poppies and stuff like that it is such a big thing in england um uh more so than america like you get a little bit of it in america um, but it is more, um, it's so much more well, British. I mean, the politics of memory are very factually fascinating about this. Look, the French don't want to remember the Second World War, right? Yeah, so right. they remember the heroism of the First World War. Sure. And and the British, the British lost uh, uh, their empire ultimately because of the 800,000 plus British and Commonwealth dead that came out of the First World War. And that is, it leaves these psychic, conscious wounds that you, that you that are barely articulable uh throughout it you know america lost i think uh, approximately a hundred thousand or so in the first world war which is still a horrifying number right horrifying right. but i think a good chunk of that was to disease and uh, and, and out of wounds and things such as that right, right. It, if the war it, had ended in november 1918 the plan was that the Brit that the americans would have taken up the brunt of the fighting right because their force would have would exponentially expanded into right. 1919, but you know, you know, thankfully, you know, 
thankfully it ended in November. Um, but yeah, the, the politics of memories surrounding this thing are absolutely fascinating. And that's something that I also play wanted to put into my module because it is forgotten about because the soldiers that are that I feature in my module are from divisions that were given to the British to serve under British command, actually an Australian commander overall of them. They were borrowed soldiers. And General Pershing told Woodrow Wilson, I am going to have my own independent campaign it, uh, uh, command. It is not going to be under any foreign command. But when he got over there, the British needed these soldiers so badly that that uh, politics, high politics got into it. And they were basically lent to the British to help crack the Hindenburg line. And it is such... A, a a remarkable story, such a forgotten story, that even in it, through the collective storytelling that can come out of tabletop RPGs, I wanted to honor these men and women. Where mm -hmm. there was quite a bit of nurses there, going to the American graveyard on the Somme, you see the women; they're there as well. They served as well, just right. to honor these men and women who died for a cause they believed in that we can barely understand today. And to mm -hmm. me, there's something magnificent about that, but there's something co cosmically horrifying about that. And I I tried to get that yeah. into what I wrote. So. Well, it, it certainly is. Uh, you are certainly playing with all those elements, I think. And uh, um, I, it, it's, I'm happy to have your it, clear passion uh, that you put into it uh, on display and, and it, it is in the adventure. Um, so I think in kind of like uh, starting to move toward wrapping up uh, this little interview that we've had today, um, I have a, I, I imagine that uh, you would number one recommend that people go to France and go to the the graveyard that you've mentioned or any of the others take the tour that'd be the number one i would assume that it would be your number yes. one uh recommendation for anyone who wants to like learn more to experience the 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 this i don't know ritual act of remembrance or whatever or to confront that themselves but failing that like what would be some other top things that you either like media to consume or uh books to read uh uh, you know, games to check out. What What are some of your recommendations for somebody to uh, experience at least part of this, uh, you know, without leaving the, maybe the comfort of their home, but certainly not leaving the shores of, of the of North America. So I think, look, there's a tremendous amount of work out there uh, about the first world war um, that I think people uh, can experience. Yes, there is nothing like going to the battlefields and seeing things um, firsthand, it's beyond comprehension. There are two books in particular that I would recommend to folks who really want to get a sense of what the war was like, right? One is what I would call a massive tome by a guy named Hugh Strawn, all right? That's called Two Arms. And it is, I think, the most thorough background to the war uh it deals with 1914 in particular but also deals with um uh factors like environmental legacies of the war financing of the war the campaigns in africa the eastern front um how the western front became what the western front was and there's an essay on in there called the ideas of the first world war that I single-handedly think is one of the best essays I've ever read. It simply talks about why men fought continually for four years. What it's to fight for that long and at that scale, an industrial war is not simply her ha ha. We're, we're fighting for the flag. You're fighting for ideals, and it goes very deeply into that the romantic german spirit versus the cosmopolitan spirit of france and britain civilization versus culture you know and it's it it changed my mindset uh 
completely on how I think about the First World War. The second book that I would recommend, I think, is the best single volume history of the First World War. It simply is called 1914 through 1918, The History of the First World War by a guy named David Stevenson. David Stevenson is out of the London School of Economics. He's a remarkable historian. This is the single best one volume history of the entire war. And I would highly recommend either Two Arms by Hugh Strawn or this book by Stevenson for anybody who wants to go further in depth into their studies of the First World War. And anybody who wants to be a potential game designer uh, mm -hmm. for uh, a system that deals with the First World War in particular. So, yeah. All right. Well, uh, we'll uh, put probably both of those in the uh, description uh, of this video so that people can go and 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 see the see the names written out um uh thank you for your recommendations thank you for sharing your uh, personal stories uh thank you for your passion today and uh, your time for this interview i really appreciate it's, it henry it's it's been a great honor thank you so much and thank you for allowing me to honor these men and women in this way it may seem silly to some but as long as their stories are being told we shall remember them mm. and that's that's important so so thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. It is uh, memorializing the effort and the the the, the individuals is a, a theme, uh, I think, that has gone through uh, the projects as, as a, the, the different books that we've done over the years. So, um, yeah, it, I think I think you're right on track there. Um, again, thank you for your time. And uh, uh, I think that's that's the end. So uh, say, right. say goodbye. Hey, thank you for your time. Thank you for creating such a wonderful system and such an evocative game. Uh, it's been an honor to be a part of this project, and I look forward to perhaps being a part of it in the future. Keep up the great work. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>